Stevie. Right. Welcome everyone this evening. Um, good to see everybody here. My name is Sasha Morris. I'm the geologist stroke educator for the Waitaki Whitestone Geopark. And uh, we have these talks every third Thursday of the month uh, with a variety of expert speakers. So this evening we've got the privilege of having Clement here all the way up from Dock in Dunedin. And he's going to be uh, talking to us about limestone ecosystems. And he's brought with us a couple of uh, partners in crime. So we've got uh, Jacinda from the Targa University uh, Botany Department here, and Katia, who's the QE2 Trust representative for this region as well. And we've got Tom somewhere. We've got two Toms, actually. Oh, two Toms. <laughs> <laughs> from Doc. So welcome to you all, and thank you for making your way up from Dunedin and Lakeley. Uh, just as a side issue, this is being recorded for our YouTube channel, so if there is anything that you missed or you want to re-watch, that will be available online in the next couple of weeks. So over to you, thank you very much. Thank you very much. So yeah, Thank you very much all for coming. I would, like she said, we have experts coming to talk about yeah. things. I am no <laughs> expert in limestone, uh, and I'm actually quite new to the, to the region as well. But Basically, today I'm going to talk about the state of affairs that I've inherited as I'm only pretty new to DOC and why I'm working in limestone and what the plan is from then on, basically. So that picture was, is from Earthquake, which is definitely uh, in the Waitaki Valley. And it's, it's one of the sites that has been bought by DOC pretty recently and that I'll, I'll be working pretty heavy, heavily on. So, <coughs> limestone ecosystem research and, and management, I, I I kind of thought I would start with who, where, and what. Uh, so who, a lot of people actually, and uh, we start, Doug is really investing heavily on limestone at the moment through a new team that was bought, like, brought together through funding uh, in 2018, and that team is the Naturally Array and Threaten Ecosystems team, which is a big name, and I'll explain uh, just after why that name came about. But there's also a lot of other people working in the limestone space in the Waitaki Valley. We've got the QE2 Trust, so Katia will talk to you about that a bit. Uh, we've got a lot of volunteers, and I can see some faces in the first, <laughs> first row. So a lot of volunteers put a lot of time in that. So every time we get volunteers, it's a bonus because we stretch for capacity all the time. Uh, University of Otago is coming into the fold now because my background is in academia. So I'm trying to get people from uni to help and get involved because that's where the knowledge is built and that's how we get people involved in the long term. Uh, we've got a lot of local stakeholders now interested in the limestone space because there's a lot of value in it as you'll see uh, along that talk. Uh, some private landowners have started coming forward. I won't name any names in case they would be ashamed of collaborating with Doc, you never know. But the, like private landowners are really getting into that space as well. And I've, I've put the, anyone else keen because we're always welcoming anybody with open arms to, to work with us. So where? Well, actually, nationally, so my team, which is a, that ecosystems team, work on nationally. So we, I work on limestone on the national level. I just focus heavily on the Waitaki Valley because I'm based in the need and, and there's a lot of value in limestone in the Waitaki Valley. But basically the whole of the eastern South Island whole limestone holds a lot of ecological value and it's been under a lot of stress and threats for a long time and it's about time we invest into it. And of course, like I said, the Waitaki Valley is my main focus at the moment. Mm -hmm. And what's, well, a lot of rare plants, uh, as I'll, I'll show you uh, during that talk, which one of them, this one is the uh, Gentianella calcis, is actually only found in the Waitaki Valley. So that's one of the, the gems of the Waitaki Valley when it comes to limestone. Uh, limestone is under a lot of pressure from pests and weeds, so there's a lot of work to be done on them because that question keeps on coming back all the time. But also there's other values that have been kind of overlooked for a long time which come with invertebrates and reptiles as I'll show during my talk. So just a bit about me, I'm, taking, I'm a science advisor ecosystems in DOC, which means that if the things we don't know, we don't know how to do to manage things, then it's for me to find out. So I do the science to inform the management. So often I get a lot of questions from a lot of people going, how do we do that? I'm like, I don't know yet, so I, I, I need to find out. But I come from academia, so I'm from uh, Dijon in France. So, which is funny because a lot of people, if I say Dijon, a lot of people will say mustard, but uh, uh, Burgundy is actually 
uh, limestone based. So where I come from, there's a lot of limestone, which is kind of funny because now back to, to the limestone, even though it's the other way across the world. So I came to the need in 2005 to do my PhD in uh, parasitology, so nothing to do with limestone. I did my PhD, they really loved the Eden, but I went back to France for a few years and was like, no, I missed the Eden too much. Came back for postdoc in for six years and I still wanted to make it in academia, so I got a, a lecturer position in Edmonton, Canada. And I went there for 18 months, but that actually says a lot about uh, Edmonton, Canada. <laughs> <laughs> so when I was there, I went through only one winter, but February, I think we for five weeks, we didn't go above minus 25 degrees. <laughs> with a, a peak at minus 42. Oh. So that was a picture of me after 10 minutes walking outside, and the frost you can see around my face is from my breath. But literally, if you walk 10 minutes outside, your skin would freeze on your cheeks. The only part of the skin that was exposed would freeze. So after six months, my wife and kid and I were like, yeah, no. <laughs> so, and then at the time, I kind of wanted a change of scenery and I wanted to come back to New Zealand and kind of make a difference. So that sounds cheesy sometimes, but that's why I, I got into DOC. So what, what are naturally rare and threatened ecosystems? So believe it or not, there's between 70 and 90 defined rare ecosystems in New Zealand. They all share common features. Uh, the main one is they're less than 0.5% of the surface of New Zealand, so basically maximum 134,000 hectares, which is pretty small. Some of them are even smaller than that. Uh, they're very hard to map because they're very small and discrete, so when it comes to mapping, it's very, very difficult unless you do a lot of brown trussing, which is impossible because it's too expensive. Uh, they have surprisingly high level of biodiversity and they have very many threatened species. For the size they are, they actually contain a disproportionately high uh, biodiversity in New Zealand. And because they're small, whatever they contain is de facto threatened, basically. Uh, so they have very specific threats, but and some of the common threats have very specific effects on this system, and we don't understand those threats really well, and we don't really know how to control most of those threats which is why uh, that new team of threatened ecosystem came to exist in DOC. Uh, <coughs> like I said, we, there's a lot of things we don't know, and the other issue is because they're small, they're hard to encompass into a national park, so there's a very high occurrence on private land, and they're very poorly represented into public and conservation land, which makes it the conservation and management quite hard, until you get private landowners who are keen to collaborate with you, which is really good when that happens. So because we have so many ecosystems, the first thing that my team had to do was to prioritize because obviously we can't invest into 90 different ecosystems. So we went through a round of consulting with a lot of experts trying to get everybody's view and expertise to factor in and we came up with a bit of a top 10 to 12 which is at least and uh, the important thing you can see in there is that there's actually the limestone ecosystem is, is finely divided into cliffs and rubbles and talus and different things, but they show up twice in the top 10. So it was a no-brainer to actually invest time and money and capacity into limestone. The other one I'm working on in Otago is the in inland sea lion. So the salt pans are actually only present in central Otago. The whole of New Zealand, those systems are only found in Otago. Uh, the other one I'm, I'm starting to work in are uh, cold water springs and coastal turf, so I do a bit of work in the Catlins and around uh, the Need and the Tunnel Beach, particularly. So, coastal turf is those really cool looking uh, white flowers. But a lot of the work and investment is in the eastern lowland limestone and the Waitaki Valley. But limestone really is present everywhere, so if you look at the geology of New Zealand, different limestone, because limestone encompasses a lot of different geology. And I won't go there because Cathy will look at me going like, what are, what are you talking about? <laughs> She's a geologist, so any question about the actual stone, just like oh, ask Cathy. Oh, <laughs> oh, <laughs> oh, oh, yeah. so the a geologist in her own state. But it's really present everywhere, but there's a good chunk of it in the eastern South Island. And quite a bit around uh, the Waitaki Valley. So, Omaro, I think it's Waimate. I cut off Timaro because who cares about Timaro? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> uh, but some of the sites that are uh, 
been bought by Doug are in Duntron and between Duntron and Carrow. But a lot of the, that limestone is pretty spectacular in, in, the, in the valley. And that's where most people see the value of limestone. If you talk to the Joe blog around New Zealand and you talk limestone, they'll be like, yeah, it looks cool. It's all about the landscape. Like, everybody knows that's Elephant Rocks, that's Castle Hill. You, get, you can even find guides online how to climb on limestone. And, but that's really like most people will, will think limestone, they will think that. And of course, it's got a lot of value. And again, I'm not pointing fingers or blaming anybody because the way I come from in France is the same story. You've got uh, vineyards, farms, uh, lime quarries, or uh, store. I mean, Dijon in France was built on limestone as well. So it's just, it's just a state of fact because limestone is rich soil, it's really good material, it's good fertilizer, so it makes complete sense to exploit it when, <coughs> when it's right there. And again, that's elephant rock. So even though it's very famous for its landscape, it's still active farming. What is less known, well, sorry, yeah, I missed that one. There's also obviously the cultural, historical, and paleontological value uh, on limestone. So the Waiteki Valley is known for the vanished wells and the fossil trade. And the interpretation panel at Earthquakes that the Geopark is talking about renovating at the moment only mentions the uh, geology and the fossils. There's nothing about the ecological value of limestone. Which is, but the, the geopark has been really good and proactive at trying to, to like include that in there. Obviously, there's a lot of cultural value for Iwis and Maris. I will not talk about it because I, I mean, not competent to do that. And I know it's a bit of a kind of very active subject at the moment. I'm still trying to engage with the local Ronaka, so I, it's definitely not my place to talk about it. So there's also a lot of information from subfossils. And a lot of really interesting information comes from the, those subfossils. We know, for example, that the Waitaki Valley limestone contains Duvosel's gecko, which is, if you talk to people around New Zealand, they say, oh, Duvosel's gecko is like it's North crazy. Island, small islands, that's where you find them. But actually, they were pretty prevalent in limestone in the South Island. You find laughing owl bones, you find moa bones, you find uh, house eagle bones. So we know a lot from just digging up subfossil bones from limestone and it's really interesting because it kind of changes your your mindset around what New Zealand was like before we, we cleared all that and we know that from those bones that they would most of the limestone would have been heavily forested because those species was were forest dwellers so all those subfossils actually bring in a lot of uh, history and around the ecology and I would argue that uh, Boamaro is now becoming historical and cultural as well because the steampunk quarter is pretty cool and all of that is becoming part of the history of New Zealand. What's less known, like I mentioned, is the actual ecological value of limestone. And there's a, it's a bit of a longer list, but I'll go through that. In 2018, there were 152 species of plants known from limestone and limestone specific. So that's a lot of species. And at the time, 61 were still unnamed. So we knew they existed, but there would have been so little work done on them that they didn't have a proper description or name, which makes it really hard to preserve and manage them because we won't even know what the name is or where they are. 95% <coughs> are endemic or regionally restricted. Like I mentioned, quite a few species are restricted to the Waitaki Valley and even to a couple of sites in the Waitaki Valley. <coughs> like 70% of the total distribution of less than 10 hectares in the whole of New Zealand. So when you think that way, you're like, well, obviously the threat level should be the highest possible. And most of them, most of those species actually have a very, very high threat level. Uh, and like, like that's actually shown by a third of these species are nationally critical, which is the highest threat level you can find in New Zealand. And for a lot of other taxa, we know virtually nothing. So lichens, there are a lot of lichen species that are limestone specific, but we know basically nothing on them. Uh, invertebrates, a lot of... Obviously, if we've got so many specific plants to limestone, those plants will have pollinators or insects attached to them, which means that if we don't know about the plants, we don't know about these insects either. So there's a lot of knowledge gaps. And... Uh, I'll talk a bit about these guys, but the limestone snails are really interesting and the very high endemic uh, snail diversity in limestone, which has been 
kind of well documented up north but has been completely overlooked in the south so we know next to nothing about these guys so i had a student summer student do some work uh, this summer so i'll talk about it a bit but she's she's found some pretty cool things and the reptiles <laughs> limestone is a perfect habitat for lizards because there's nooks and crannies and it's thermally really good they can bask and believe it or not there's hardly any work that's been done on lizard on limestone so the first thing i did was try um, order a report a contractor to do a stock take on all the data and look at where the limestone is in New Zealand and what the distribution is known for lizards and basically all lizards overlap with limestone somewhere so there's potentially high value for lizards on limestone and just the guards road side which is in the Waitaki Valley which is a middle of farmland uh, there's quite high density of lizards and three species there so it's the limestone acts as a refugia probably for all of those lizards and I know sites in North Canterbury it's a bit hush hush because those species are highly endangered but some of the limestone sort of like rough geckos of jewel geckos brain geckos hanging up them so there's obviously a lot of value for lizards but it's never actually mentioned so there's <coughs> a, f a few uh, interesting plants so this one is high lim uh, limestone only occurs on limestone bluffs and cliffs and there's a a few species from the from Canterbury and uh, this one the black-eyed gecko is uh, nationally vulnerable is found quite heavy, heavily on the limestone around uh, Nelson and Marlboro so all the limestone you see around New Zealand holds very high ecological value just by the fact that a lot of those species are highly endangered so what are the threats to specifically I'm going to talk now specifically about the eastern South and limestone one of the threats, well, there's many threats, uh, past and current. Uh, one of the main problems at the moment is just to do a stock take of what they do, survey and monitor those sites. Because you can play some pretty interesting game at find a nationally critical plant every time you go and visit the site. So in the middle of photo, those kind of green leaves with the white flowers is a gentianella calcis, and it lives there. <laughs> and the rest around is just uh, introduced grass so you're kind of crawling on your knees trying to find a plant and believe it or not but in this one there's also a nationally critical plant so the clump of green thingy with a dead stone is lepidium cisimbrioides which is nationally critical as well so just finding your, your ecological value is sometimes very difficult again there's high value and a lot of workers on private land so it's harder to protect that's an example from southland where uh, re there's a lime quarry and via the, like the pressure from the community actually made ravens down, rivers down promise to stop any more exploration mining and preserve the what, what did say, the west was the western face or whatever but if you look at the picture from uh, google map they actually got in the back of it so the the cliff remains but they're just digging slowly away at the back of it so it's, it's really interesting how the and they were, if, if it wasn't for the community pressure, they would have just taken the whole thing away. So we would, we would have been left with a, with a pit of limestone. But again, I can't blame anybody because it's high value stuff and 50 years ago it was perfectly, perfectly okay to do that. But that high value makes it harder to preserve. Again, a lot of it occurs on private land. That's another farming station with a lot of uh, limestone around. Uh, quite a few plants left on there, but the farmer is just running goats as you do, just to control the thistle. So you end up with really good looking gentian, but these guys actually hang where the goats can't go. And for some of the plants, we have to, we have to kind of micro protect them because that's the only way we can do things. Because that's just the way it is, it's private land, it's farm, and that's fine. But like when you kind of micromanaging the plants, you do what you can. And the irony is with the goats, is Yes, they will. If they are forced, they will eat young gorse and they will yeah, eat yeah, thistles. Yeah, <laughs> but they will much rather eat the gentian yeah, and everything else. Yeah, because the gentian is actually yes. highly palatable yeah. for, for goats and, and sheep. So mm. obviously, it's a bit of a balance. But like, you just you just need to, to do your, your work and, and mm. work with these goats. The only the other thing it kind of goes back to find your plants. They're actually very difficult to monitor and manage because of the terrain, the habitat, and the criticism of, the, of these plants. Some of the plants are like. I'm no botanist, so honestly, the, the topic she you tell me that's a very rare herb or whatever, like grass. I'm like, I can't tell the difference between the fescue and that. 
So like you, you can see the really hard top button is going like, see, look, in the nook and cranny, you can see it. I'm like, oh, for sure. <laughs> but also like that's that's back in the days, but Doc would not allow that kind of work nowadays. No. Like you'd, you'd have to be roped in and sign a whole lot of clearance <laughs> to do that. And I got back to it. <laughs> and this one is, is interesting because you look at the picture and you look at the button. That's what buttonists in Doc look like. They're usually on all four crawling down and looking down. <laughs> so if, if you see someone like that, you definitely see a buttonist. But that picture is interesting because it looks like, oh, look, there's plenty of nice plants and flowers, but that's actually stone crop, which is a, a bad, really bad weed on limestone. Mm -hmm. And these guys are really kind of babysitting what, what they can find. And like literally some of those plants, that's scalabini, which is also, I can't remember the threat label, but it's not even threatened, but you look at it and you're like, unless you know exactly what you're looking for, it's very hard. So you need really skilled people, which makes it hard because they're hard to come by. And because those plants are so rare and the population are so small, there's also a problem, inherent problem with small population is that if any disease show up, they can wipe out some population just like that because there's no backup. So at the moment, we've got issue with the uh, albugo fungus, which is a brassica fungus, but because there's so much brassica everywhere, it kind of goes everywhere, which reminds me that some of the plants at Gauss Road look pretty bad today. Mm -hmm. Some that didn't have albugo before. Uh, so, and when you look at plants, that's, that's stone and now you're looking at kind of one plant trying to see if it's healthy or not. And Clement. if you look at that... Yep. Why does there seem to be more plants one way and these plants the other way? What do you mean? Like, there's one plant up there with 112 plants. Oh yeah, that's a good question. So I know. Like <laughs> <laughs> no, actually, the, so the one why is that one plant alone? I don't know. But why is are these plants kind of hanging up that side? That's because they're on the shaded side of there. So and they're like cool, moist. The top of a cliff as well, so the sheep, yeah. the stock couldn't just get yeah. to eat when it was grazed. They couldn't just get to eat all the plants, whereas that's quite accessible. Oh uh, yeah, good point. North, so. so yeah, these ones were like it's pretty hard to get for sheep but the one that they kind of probably is the one that kind of should avoid some of the sheep but it's just to like see like if that that side's got i don't know for some reason there's a fire or something that's one population gone there's nothing you can do about it because it's so such small population and it also comes with other small population effects is that the genetics is not really well known but you know that when you go down to a certain level of individuals and they're breeding so it, because they have to breed with each other at some point it can be a problem and at that site earthquake which is also in the Waitaki Valley the Lepidium cisimbriatis which is the common name is Schist Crest we've got two plants well actually you know Tom Reed discovered some recently mm. but we've got two mature plants which are both females and those species are, are males and female plants so basically we've got two mature females but with no pollen donor so this year they produce seed pods but with no seeds inside because there's no pollination so no cross fertilization so when you go down to that kind of level of population, you really run into problems that uh, that go on top of your other problems, which are all the weeds and everything. So it, it becomes really difficult when you get such small populations to work with. And we've got many issues and currently very few solutions, at least large scale. So we, we're still doing like the guys here work really hard to try to keep those plants alive. Well, that's a uh, flyer that was done for the Geopark by a science com student at the table. And if you look at those plants, so these plants are all uh, Waitaki <coughs> Valley. Uh, the, the one at the top is really interesting. The Paki Clayton is actually the New Zealand's sixth most endangered species. So it's higher than some kiwis, it's higher than a lot of birds. But I'm sure you never heard of it in the news. Or you never heard in, in New Zealand going like we're transporting some plants. <laughs> <laughs> so like when, when you talk about those kind of plants, it's harder to get buying from public and from uh, founders <laughs> but it's actually I think all in the whole of New Zealand there was 50 individual plant left and today I was talking with a contractor or a consultant who works with on limestone in, the, in Hawks Bay and they got a species of myosotis up there and they've got one plant that's all they've got left they've got a few in cultivation but in the world there's one, one individual they know of so, and all these plants are Waitaki plants and they're the NCV, they're all nationally critical, which is a level of threat you go for kiwis and kakapos. So that's, that's kind of the level of threat we're talking about. So what are we doing currently? 
we're monitoring to like try to understand why some of those plants are doing okay, why they're not, how many we've got, how many we're working with. Uh, we do seed collection and propagation, so we do uh, collect seeds of gentian and lepidium for the Waitaki Valley anyway. Uh, we try to survey so that that big mature plant of lepidium uh, has been like we rediscovered a few of them at Gals Road. Here, that's the second tome of the OMRO office, kind of babysitting some gentian. So there's a lot of trying to keep alive what we've got at the moment, which I call it babysitting in a not in a cynical way, more in a like. That's what we do because we have to. So we, we have to keep those plants alive until we we understand better about like large scale management. The other thing is raise awareness, like I said, because a lot of people don't know about it. So fortunately, the geopark has been helping, and one student from the science come that randomly would like he was really interesting. He was kind of getting contact with people that you didn't know of, but it all panned out really well. So Tom and I were actually involved in the in the magazine article in the Latitude magazine in February, I think, which was really good because the, the, the journalists really listened to what we had to say and we really tried to put on the forefront that we needed more awareness around that. Uh, and any time someone reaches out to me, I'm happy to try to help and see what I can do to so we can work together. But one thing that Petrina Duncan was a student who did that put in the flight that, that really like it, that's called uh, Maricot. Ahako Aiti Paunamo, also it is small, it is a treasure. Like I said, they're all highly endangered, nationally critical. They're endemic to New Zealand. If we lose them, it's like losing a kiwi. So there's no reason why you shouldn't be considered a, as high as kiwis or caggable. So we, we can't afford to lose these plants because there's no going back. Like, extinction is forever. So we, we have to do what we can to try and save them. Got another question. Yep. Uh, um, why do like um, is it like any like we can't go because it's like native like endangered plants that like castle hill or elephant rocks? Uh, well, the the rare plant at castle hill are pretty well looked after. I think they cage elephant rocks got nothing. So that's a, that, but that's another good question. At the moment, like if there was a place again, I like, go to Kiwi and Kagapo. If there was a place with Kagapo, we'd stop people to go. But at the moment, we don't do that for plants. Which is, I'm always for advocating. So if there are plants and we want people to care for them, they need to see it. They need to see them. But then <coughs> it becomes too many people and become a problem. Which is what I'm actually witnessing with the coastal turf at Tunnel Beach because now it's become like that social social media thing. People go down to Tunnel Beach to take a picture on the cliff and now we've got trenches in the coastal turf because people just plow through it. Mm -hmm. And it really just wants a picture at the edge of the cliff. So yeah, it's a good question. Like we want people to see them, but we don't want too many people to get interested in. <laughs> which is a fine balance to work, but that's a very good question. Thank you for that. So in the long term, the long term, so we've been looking really species focused for a long time. So now we need to shift to the, the bigger picture. We need, if you look after the ecosystems, the plants will look after themselves. So that's really the kind of shift in mindset we, we need to we need to have. So but first to do that we need to set goals and identify issues because a lot of people come to me and go like, <laughs> what are you gonna do to restore the ecosystem? I'm like First, if to do that, we would need to know exactly what it looked like before. And restoring means that we need to bring the mowers and laughing owls and house eagle back. So we're not going to be able to do that. So the question is, how do we enhance the system for the plants to be able to look after themselves? Which is very different. So once we have identified the goals and issues, then what do we do? And finally, we need to find out how we do it. So it's a bit of a, at the moment, it's a bit of a lot of cockles are grinding and trying to, to find out how to do that. So to do that, one way to do that is to try to build what's called a conceptual model, where you identify your conservation goals, which are in green, then what tells you that you reach those goals, and then you put in the threats to those goals, and anyways. And if you think that's complicated, that's a very simple conceptual model. <laughs> <coughs> some of them look like a plate of spaghetti with some meatballs on top. But anyways, if you do that, it always comes back to the same threats, which often are grazing, browsing, uh, weeds. The weed is the biggest one in, in uh, limestone. So even though it looks quite complex, it's a good way to visualize what your goals are, which is 
one main one in limestone, it restores the <coughs> associated woody cover, so the forest around the limestone outcrop that would have protected the limestone from the extreme weather and the weeds. You need to maintain and restore those plants, you need to maintain and restore those invertebrates that are pollinating the plants, and you need to make sure we have assistance one, from us. One of those things that um, yep. is going on up the Waitaki Valley now is the intensive farming issue. And you, you've got up there pollination failure. Yep. One of the biggest threats and causes of that is the pesticides that are used on the winter crops where they winter. Yep. Yep. And it's killing the, the moths, some of them are only about this size, the, and yeah. the insect life that actually pollinate the native plants. Yeah, so that's a good point, but the trust is at the moment we don't even know what the pollinators are. So like, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. But which one, yes, but yeah. I mean, the thing is there's some things we can deal with, others we, we can't, and like mm. farming intensification is, I think we have to work with it, because mm. it's going to be hard to do anything about it. I mean, from our point of view, from my position, I can have no power against it. So it's more working. But I believe that once we restore that bush buffer around, we might actually make an effect there. Because it might filter some of the things that's coming from outside. So it's, it's very fine balance. Yeah, you're talking yeah. about the forgotten flora here. Yeah. And um, the, the <laughs> counter side to that is the forgotten fauna, which is yep. yeah, the pollinators. Yep. No, I agree. But yeah, it's, it's a tricky one. So, in some, but like, uh, so yeah, we, we can talk about it now. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the one thing where we've done really well and that does really well at the ecosystem level is actually take care of what's called the woody weeds. So, gauze, brown, buckthorn, pine, and cotonaster. So, the two terms have done a really good job, and the predecessors have done a really good job. So, that's God's Road when Doug bought it. So, now there's a cow park. I don't know. Anybody's? Yeah? Oh, um. Vine is sort of like hard to cut down because I probably like planted like a hundred years ago. So like Which ones? The pine trees. Mm -hmm. uh, pine trees are easy, trust me, because <laughs> you cut the die. But like some of the, the other woody plants are like you can have the two times after. They mm. tell, they'll talk the, to you about the buckthorn. The buckthorn is really, really spiky. It comes from Africa. So it's to keep the lions and elephants out of people's farms. And also, the, the phrase we, we go by is that you need to kill it three times so you can kill it and poison it and it will come back again and you've got to do it again and three times later you might have actually dealt with the, the shrub. It's really hard to get rid of permanently. Yeah. But yeah, so that was Girls Road when Doug bought it, so all of that kind of looked like, oh no, you've got some bush lip there, but it's actually <laughs> solid box thorn. Mm -hmm. And the box thorn, the other name he goes by around his African thorn because he comes from South Africa, so you see he <coughs> was introduced for fencing. And that's actually someone who's done a really good job at keeping it as fencing material. Mm -hmm. And like Tom mentioned, he, he's used in South Africa to keep the lions away, so it's just to give you an idea of how nasty the stuff <laughs> is. <laughs> it's like bad boy, the spines about it that long, I had one come through the soil and make sure once. So it's really nasty, but like they've done, that's kind of it looks more like that now. It's been pretty well cleared. So we are really good at looking after the gold brown buckthorn. So all the woody kind of shrubby things we've done really well, which is a first step because that's years in the making to get rid of that, and they're still working on it because, like Tom said, it takes three times to actually be dead. <coughs> So now we basically, we do that really well, but now we need to understand some other things. So there's a lot of research starting and ongoing. So the first one is, does weed control actually benefit the nat native plant? Because in some cases you've got plants growing within the grass and you remove the grass and the plant actually exposed to the sun and they kill over because you just kind of change the microclimate around them. So we really need to understand if that works really well. So there's someone doing some research on, at Castle Hill at the moment. The other one is when we start losing plants and we got, we need to move them, so we're working on, there's someone working on translocation of those threatened plants. But I've been looking at other things, so the native snail in limestone ecosystem, native snails are quite extraordinary in New Zealand, there's a, the highest diversity of snails in the world by a order of magnitude is in, on limestone in New Zealand. So I've had a student, summer student, we're looking at them over the summer, so I'm, I'm going to talk to him about that a bit. Uh, the other one is large scale woody uh, restoration, and Gals Road is going to be the, the first kind of site we're going to try all that. 
and also the lizard fauna in limestone and the effects of the grass because there's been quite a few studies showing that when the grass is really high and thick there's a lot of rodents and the rodents will uh, predate on the lizards so because of uh, because those the Garzron and earthquake and now dog reserves have been fenced, the uh, stock has been removed so now the, the grass is taken over pretty well and it's probably attracting quite a few rodents and predators so I'm going to look at the effect of these on lizards so I've got some lizard monitoring going on at uh, Gars Road and I'll, I'll look at the predators pretty soon. So native lambton snails. There's about, I think it's about 150 species in New Zealand. There's some ecosystem on, some limestone ecosystem in the North Island where in a small patch of forest you've got 65 different species. I think a very diverse snail diversity in Europe would be about 10 to 12. And the second highest is uh, some forests in Australia where they've got about 20 species. So New Zealand's got a massive diversity of uh, limestone snails, and that's the kind of size you're looking at. So some of the species are literally one millimeter in diameter. So when you're looking for limestone snails, <laughs> it's like really crawling and look. And they are really limestone snails, the, the New Zealand snails, they don't have uh, an operculum, so they can't close their shell like the garden snails and they pulmonate. So if it gets too wet, they drown. If it gets too dry, they dry. So they need some really specific habitats and they're really associated with mature native forest. So my idea was to go around this eastern side and different limestone sites with different state of native bush and see if that actually reflected into the, the snail diversity. And it actually perfectly reflects on it. So if you lose bush, you lose snails, they don't come back. Which was really interesting because I went to a site in Southland, Castle Rock, if you've been there, that's when that Ravens Down lime mine is. But the farmer's got another block with really nice bush and limestone. And I got there with my student and we were really excited. We started turning logs, collecting leaf litters, went back to the lab and my student called me back a couple of days later. She's like, I've, I've hardly found any snails. I'm like, oh, that's weird. So I called the farmer and he's like, do you know if that bush has always been there or if it's regenerating and he's like oh, I don't know I've only been on the place about 10 years but I'll do some digging and he digged up some pictures from the 70s where everything got sprayed and burned there was nothing left so even though now it's coming away the snails are not coming back with it because they're gone they were gone when that, that bush went so it's a really good indicator of the state of affairs but I think we should very clearly think about translocation if we do some restoration on the forest. But snails are really, really cool. You can go to Gauss Road and Earthquake, you'd still find some. And the, sh the shells are amazing. When you look under the microscope, some of them have some like, really fine hair decoration on them. They're really cool snails. Uh, the other one is uh, lizard fauna in mountain ecosystem. So like I said, uh, I'm going to be looking at the effect of rain grass, rodents and predators. At the moment, I'm, I'm on my second month of lizard monitoring, so I'm getting the baseline data of the lizards. But interestingly enough, they're actually doing okay considering the conditions. So if you go to Guards Road, there's actually a fairly high density of uh, those guys. So there's two species of macans which has the one with a broken line on their backs and the uh, southern grass king with, which have a very very nice uh, golden line going all the way uh, we've got a few geckos which is interesting because <coughs> geckos are way more vulnerable to hedgehogs specifically but even though they're doing okay a lot of these guys would have bits of tail missing or regenerating which is often a sign that they're under quite a high pressure from rodents and hedgehogs so that's another thing I'm going to be looking at is uh, the density of hedgehogs and how they use the limestone, which is completely unknown. Um, on, on Banks Peninsula, it was Matagari and some of the other, other plants that really tangled for pink woods and things like yep. that. The lizards actually live in those and yep. they sun themselves on those. So yep. the box fawn, maybe, mm -hmm. because they originally got rid of the Matagari because yep. it was it tangled on the fleece of their sheep. <laughs> The box spawn's taken over and has replaced that habitat yep. for them. So, yeah, so, so some of the stumps, like lizards, will use some of the box spawn mm, and stumps. rats and yeah, that can't get into the box spawn to, yeah, to get so at them. The, the rats don't like to go into the box spawn, unfortunately, the hogs don't mind yeah. at all, they just squeeze <laughs> under and they go in. The oh, really? hedgehogs will go in, yeah. 
Wow. So yeah, and the hedgehogs like I know a lot of people find hedgehogs really cute, but hedgehogs are, are <laughs> mean predators. Mm -hmm. But yeah, so I'm, I'm gonna use the lizards as an indicator of what happens. Like we're gonna do some management on soil now that we know what the lizards do. Can we kind of have an idea of our management is doing any difference by looking at the lizards and also looking at potential translocation based on surface soil evidence because we know what was there before. So if we manage to get the system going again, can we consider translocating some lizards back? And one of the big ones at the moment is looking at the effect of like the kind of appearance on forest and limestone. Historically, most lowland soil would have been like that. So that's actually Nappi Nappi on north of Christchurch. So if you've never been there, go. It's absolutely amazing. You've got those limestone outcrop kind of popping out from like pure mature uh, broadleaf forest is really it's really cool looking and that basically most lowland soils would have looked like that so that's earthquakes in the Waitaki Valley it's got quite a bit of uh, native bush left uh, that's the soil I was talking about in Southland so the bush is kind of coming away but was completely clear at some point and that's an aerial picture of Gals Road which is the other side uh, we're looking at and that's bear there's absolutely nothing left. There's a tiny bit of grass scrub regenerating here. Tiny bit of grass scrub here. There's one cofoy here, so that green dot <laughs> is the one cofoy we've got. And there's a couple of prostrate cofoys here. That's willow, that's willow, and even those willows are gone because now there's a great big pivots going through the whole thing, like turning around. So that's my blank slate, and that's where. Uh, we're going to look at trying to see what it takes to actually restore that uh, forest <laughs> and what it actually does. So, because we believe it's a key to the ecosystem functioning and resilience, because it should buffer against extreme weather events, against droughts, against wind, and against weed re invasion. So, it's probable, but we need to find out. So, that was one of the community planting days that Tom organized with <laughs> <laughs> yeah, a couple it's of just volunteers. Just <laughs> Uh, yeah. Uh, so yeah, that's, that's a picture of that uh, big coffee that's left, and it only got rediscovered when the buckthorn was cleared. So uh, standing by the coffee is Graham Law, which was instrumental into clearing that buckthorn. I don't know if any of you interacted with Graham Law. Yes? No? Okay. All right. So I don't have any baggage. Good. Uh, Graham Lord did a lot of work, but he was not always the easiest person to deal with, so sometimes I think I'm paying for some of the interaction he's had in, in the valley. But he did a lot of work at sites, he actually was there before he got bought by uh, Doc, but basically at the moment we've got nothing on it, apart from a bit of grey scrub uh, regenerating and what the planting has been done by uh, Tom and, and the community. So that's those areas in blue is where we're going to focus some of the first uh, forest regeneration. So the plan is to put in about 65,000 trees mm -hmm. uh, to try to find out how to do that well, uh, when to plant, how to protect those uh, plants. And one other thing we've learned from the community planting that uh, Tom has, has been leading is that the wind is a big factor. So we've had plants in the ground, the, the trees are about that high, you put a, a tree guard about that high. And you come back after a big no whistling, and like, oh my god, all the trees have, have, have died. But what's above the garden is burned by the wind. But if you look inside the garden, they're actually still greening and they're leafy. So the wind is going to be a big factor. So I'm toying with the idea of building some wind breaks to help them, or at least at the beginning. And the, the big question is after we've done like the four to five, four, the three to four years of really high level planting. 15 years of monitoring because it takes a while to, for trees to actually grow. We need to monitor the effect of the forest generation and if it works then develop SOPs for uh, so standard operating procedures for anybody interested in doing the same as on private land or on other reserves. Because really at the moment we, we got a lot of people coming going like I really want to do that but I don't want to waste my time and money on buying trees and selling them to, the, to die which is a very good point actually. And at the same time, I'm going to monitor lizards, which is I do with artificial retreat soil. So you take two sheets of undulating, put them down, and usually because it's thermally really high quality, the lizard will use it to, to hide. And you come on a kind of coolish morning, you lift the tiles and kind of count and measure what you've got under. I'm going to do some uh, tunnel tracking and trail cameras to see what's 
uh, kind of baddies we've got running around the place, especially the ones that might eat the trees, so possums, hares and rabbits. We, yeah. we, we've used the tracking tunnels to also monitor the Yep, yeah, yeah. so you can manage the lizard and eat sex as well, yeah, so he, he waits for you. A tracking tunnel is a bit of Swiss Army knife, you can do a lot with them, and they're pretty cheap as well, which is good. Uh, they do take a bit of money, because you need to take the card and read the ink, but it's pretty cool. It can be done with the, by the, uh, with and by the community, so you, if you're ever interested in knowing <coughs> more about what's going on, like, like feel free to to reach out for sure. And so what else? Like I said, there's a lot of things we don't know. And one of the main issues we've got on the system and a lot of others is how do we remove weeds and grass? Like I'm talking the rank grass, so basically the pasture grass is coming away too far because the stock has been removed. How do we get rid of that? So we need to know how we, we do that. Uh, how do we do that the best we can and the cheapest we can? And make sure there's no undesirable effect. So so far, we spray. But the problem is we you're left with a lot of biomass, and all you get more is is more weeds. So we're kind of toying with the idea of actually scraping the top and kind of resetting the clock to zero. So Kat, you can talk to you a bit more about that. Uh, the other thing is like we've got rare plants, and we we just don't know what pollin what pollination systems they are. So that's a picture that uh, Tom took of. Uh, some lepidium uh, flower heads and there's a few bugs running on them we don't know what they are we don't know if they're actually eating the flowers or pollinating the flowers so at the moment <laughs> we don't even know how that works so like like you mentioned if we if we want to protect the plants we need to make sure the pollination actually works i think the lepidium isn't too bad they're pretty generalist they don't need specific pollinators but well, you never know and again like the <laughs> genetics is a big one because at the moment this the safe ways to consider every single population of plants separate because a lot of those plants have different level of ploidy. So if you put them together and they interbreed, then you end up with uh, infertile hybrids. But maybe not. So if we need someone, probably uni universities, to do some of the genetic background so we can we know what we can and cannot do. Because at the moment, the safe ways to just keep them separated, which is fine when you but decent population but when you start dwindling to really low numbers you're like do we need to take drastic actions and at the moment we we have no safe ways of, of doing that and of course there'll be some other question popping up uh that's a cool picture of a native bee uh yeah so the grass um, i mentioned that before the association with uh, rodents and the potential side effect on of grass removal the other question with rodents is that they eat a lot of seeds, so do they eat the seeds of our native, like rare plants? Probably. And the other question I'm really keen to answer is like, both Garth Road and Earthquake are now uh, rabbit proof fenced. And I'm really, I really want to know whether that fence that is already there can be tweaked to make it hedgehogs and rodent proof and can be used as a weed break for the plants with just be the tweaking. But there's been a lot of investment and work put into those fences, and they definitely do the job for rabbits. But the, the question is, can we kind of tweak them to make them what useful did, for others? What did they use for Arakanui? Uh, yeah, Arakanui is a pretty hardcore predator-proof fence and yeah. the price tag on it is <laughs> yeah, yeah, slightly yeah. too hard for that kind of... Yeah. But because the problem is like, hey Joe, do we climb that? Do we just go and climb and just oh. drop on the other side? Yeah. <laughs> but one of the suggestions is, uh, I'll finish that and I'll take your question. I was talking to one of the stress people in town, I was just nailing some, uh, like about that high of stainless steel, with, they can't climb on it. Yeah. Yeah. So it might be the kind of tweaking we talk about. Yeah. Yeah. And it wouldn't be that hard. Yes. Oh, stop all the things climbing up and then jumping off. You could like run it, electricity through it. <laughs> yeah, I think in terms of health and safety might be a bit of a problem. <laughs> people do that. But yeah, well, actually we do that for cattle at least, because we had a bit of a cattle invasion at Gals Road, so now there's a, there's a hot wire. But yeah, I mean, I <laughs> And the other thing is uh, trying to build in the knowledge and facilities for propagation of rare plants. And the last question is about other funnel values. Yes, there's probably a lot and so much we still don't know about that that's a trap the spider and that's that's the 
kind of door the, and I completely by chance found one at Guards Road and then when I started looking I actually found about 30 <laughs> and nobody knew about it and those guys are really cool like the female of Trap the Spiders live for up to 25 years they never leave their burrows so when they for mating the males leave their old burrows they find a female burrow and they actually drum on the lid to go like, I'm, I'm another spider, please don't shoot out and eat me. <laughs> <laughs> and if the female is impressed by the drumming, she'll open the flap, let the male in. So they mate, and then the female stays in the burrows, lays the eggs, and actually look after the babies for up to 18 months. Wow. Before the babies leave and dig their own burrows around. Th does she eat the suitor? Uh, I'm not too sure, but I think the thing is, once she lets him in, there's actually no room to eat him. Uh. So if he's let in, he's basically off the hook and then he has to shoot out pretty quick. <laughs> <laughs> but now, then she's not the one to eat the pseudo. But it's a very, very cool bug. And like every time I go there, I discover some new, some new cool insects or bugs or invertebrates. So yeah, there's a No, actually I was talking, the, I had a couple of people up there today and some of the burrows in, in the kind of crumbly lantern, like that looks like ground water burrows. I was like, actually, I never came at night. You were like, yeah, you should probably do that once and try to see what's crawling around at night and probably a lot of paperwork to sign with dogs to do it. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, going there at night would be pretty cool. But yeah, thank you very much for your attention. Hopefully one day that's what the guard road side will look like. Some limestone oak probably the background with some really cool bush in the front. Mm -hmm. And we can move away from having to babysit individual plants. But that's for the future, I guess. Uh, what are we? Uh, oh yeah, we basically running out of time. Did, did you want to talk about the actually too? Mm -hmm. Katy could well, tell you a bit. Yeah, How's okay. everyone feeling? Are you Great. could you last yes. another ten minutes or so? Yes. 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 Yeah. Okay. All right. What, do you want to any questions? For oh yeah. Do, do you have any questions? We can have, we can talk after. question around some of this really unique um, flora and fauna. Um, what sort of publications are out there? Because, you know, being the library, it'd be nice to actually have some of those. So in terms of, like, more general audience publications, there's a couple of... So Herman Franks, who is a volunteer based in Timor, doing a lot of work on South Canterbury. He's got a book on lines of values in South Canterbury. Herman Franks... Uh, and then Peter Heenan and... Mm. Who's yeah, Jeff Rogers? Yeah. 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 yeah, so there's a book by Peter Heenan that he did with Lanky, and that's a free book actually. I've actually got boxes of it, and Peter's going to give me something that I can oh. give to people, but not okay. at the moment. No, no, no but they, that, that would be the go to book for limestone plants. Yeah, one. And in terms of fauna, fauna, I don't know of anything. There's a lovely little book called oh, is it? Forgotten Fauna. That's oh, cool. the title. I've got it <laughs> well, there you are. <laughs> I don't know if it's still lot, available, it? but yeah. yeah. So, yes, it's very. So, there might be a few scientific publications on the actual description of a lot of species, but it's pretty dry, like it's pure taxonomy. So, and some of those plants, literally, if you're not a botanist, they tell you, like, if you look at the third leaf down the <laughs> and you turn it over, the third hair, like, uh, I'll take sure. <laughs> But you know, unfortunately, there isn't that much to be honest. Yeah. <laughs> okay, well, I'll try and do this quickly um, so we can get to the question time. Thank you, Tom. Thank you for having me today. Um, my name is Cathy Rufout and I work for the QE2 National Trust. It's quite a recent role for me, I've just been there since um, last September. And I also work at the geology department at the University of <laughs> So I've sort of recently come into the limestone space, so second dud for the night, I'm not an expert <laughs> at all. Um, but I just, I guess behind Clermont and I, there are a whole lot of experts, people that have been working in limestone probably since late 90s, when, when a lot yeah. of the species discoveries were made by Brian Malloy. Um, there's been Peter Heenan, I'll say some of their names in case you might know them, Joy Comrie, um, Carol Burke, Nick Head, Shannon Courtney, Jeff Rogers, Jeff yeah. Rogers um, and they have all at various times worked for DOC or with DOC and they or they may be with Landcare or they may be sort of independent but 
these people are still around and uh, for me they have been incredibly valuable because you can go and tap you know back in to all of that existing knowledge so we're sort of the front tonight but there is a team you know behind us and so really what I um, wanted to say to you all is that everything Clement has said tonight um, I completely agree with it was a fantastic <coughs> summary of limestone and all I can do as a QE2 Trust uh, representative is just let you know an alternative form of land protection to DOC because QE2 works with private landowners. So I'm just going to sort of give you an idea about sort of what that looks like and then finish up with a couple of slides um, about our limestone links specifically. I've come from Dunedin tonight, so that's where I lived, um, in Portobello on the peninsula. And as a QE2 rep for coastal Otago, I come from the Waitaki River down to the Catlins and into about middle March. Mm -hmm. So it's a big area. I've got about 145 um, protected covenants in that area, and we've got about another 20 on the books. And we would still like more. Mm -hmm. And we would particularly like to work with people who've got limestone on their property as well, for all these reasons that Clement has outlined. So this is a wonderful opportunity for me to um, be up here and to sort of just um, spread the word about QE2 um, up in this part of the country. So I'm just going to start the first slide is just really quickly whiz you through who we are. And the QE2 is a very shortened version for the QE2 National Trust started up in about the mid-70s and was all formalised by about 1977 and it really started from farmers talking to farmers and it was trying to address that gap that even like government departments, if people involved with land protection, the farmers needed advice, funding, support, incentive, some people, somewhere they can go so that they could also protect special areas on their land as well as alongside bits of land going into public estate. So that was the background behind QE2. And sort of 40 years on, it's pretty much still the same job. The type of landowners has expanded. So now we've got, um, we work with recreational groups, conservation groups, industry, mining, roading, forestry, but still farmers, whether they're agricultural or horticultural, are still by far the biggest um, group that we um, engage with. And really at the heart of a QE2 partnership with a landowner is this thing that we call the covenant. And it's, a, and it's an agreed document based on the special values of each land block that is going to be protected. And it's agreed between the landowner and QE2 and it's often had some sort of um, expert information being fed into it as well whether it's ecological or geological or archaeological, cultural. Okay, so it turns it into a legal document between QE2 and the landowner, and it is to protect in perpetuity, it's to protect forever. So even if the land sells, that QE2 block stays on the title, and the new owner is obliged to care and look after the values on that land. So that's the real heart of the partnership with QE2. And One, here, here's just a few stats, 180,000 hectares ish protected um, across New Zealand. Most of that is through the lowlands and the mid altitude. And you know if you're out and about that a lot of dock land is up in the high country or up at high altitudes or in remote areas like Fiordland. So QE2 is trying to get into that lowland, midland space where there's a lot of competi competition for um, production and land use as well. The, I just wanted to spend another slide on the benefits of the covenant because that is such an important part of the QE2 partnership. But all of the points all relate to limestone and they all kind of link into what Clement was saying. Um, it's about averting extinction for species by protecting habitats when you've got ongoing land use you know, around you. It's about supporting opportunities for new science and new knowledge to be gained by maintaining partnerships in that private land space with, limestone, with, in, with um, QE2 habitats and protected environments. It's seen like an amenity of values, but most importantly it's that first point is that QE2 forms that long-term relationship with that landowner 
And even though the field representatives might change, the landowner can always access some advice and support from QE2. And we sort of act a little bit like a node through other partnerships with DOC or with the university. We, we can sort of be someone who can broker relationships for the landowner and the landowner can be as, as directly involved or not. And so it's very, QE2 work is very much relationship driven and it's very much about supporting that through that agreed covenant deed. And really, really I've just put this in to again make links through to the limestone country that um, Clement has been talking to, that QE2 is interested in continuing to work in the limestone space because it's so important to where as an organisation it wants to go. It's really wants to keep working in the private land space where 70% of New Zealand is basically sort of in private ownership of some sort. So it's a huge part that we have to sort of keep chipping away at getting awareness and protection um, in, into the sort of main system. And, and it's about continuing to sort of um, secure special values, not only to the landowners who come initially to QE2, but for all the future generations and the next lot who are coming through as well. So we've, we've got um, places for people to understand what limestone you know, was like at different stages through its development of restoration and things. And really, um, we've had this map already, so I won't spend heaps of time, but um, what I wanted to say about this is really that we've got four field reps in QE2. I'm one of them. There's Alice Shanks from Oak Canterbury, there's Rob Smith from South Canterbury, and there's Rob Wardles from Central Otago. So there's four of us that sort of overlap and work in limestone and we're all accessible to members of the public and we're very keen to um, just keep on working with DOC and keep on working with landowners and, uh, and start to sort of support some of the research initiatives that are starting to develop as well. Um, I've talked about experts that are behind us. Really what we do on a sort of bread and butter <coughs> basis is we stay in contact with um, our landowners that we have a protection covenant with and every two years we go and visit them on their property and we check uh, their, if there's a fence, we check the integrity of the fence, we check um, the condition of the vegetation, we take regular photo points to monitor vegetation change. So there's a sort of input into that block of land at least every two years from us. Um, I should say that the word protection is very much fit for purpose in QE2. It's, it's very much um, a reflection of the values that are being brought to the table. And it's also often got some acknowledgement that there may be a working component to the block of land that's in a covenant. So there may be uh, light grazing allowed, for example, by ewes. Or maybe, maybe it's where the lambs you know, where the ewes go into land or something. So it's not a, perhaps as black and white as with DOC. There's grey areas about what protection means in QE2 and what you're sort of trying to enhance. And here's my last slide. Um, and this is the chance where um, I can talk a little bit about uh, the pulling back of the grass that Clement talked about. We've um, got a couple of limestone sites up around Kurao. They've got um, quite nice big plateaus, probably about the size of the space that we're all sort of sitting in. And some of the plateaus have got very rare native plant species on them. Uh, but one of them has basically lost all of its native plant species. And when you walk on top of that plateau, um, it's just basically a sort of a big mat of exotic grass covers that have got away because the grazing regime has you know, been taken out. And um, not so long ago, Clement and I went there with um, Doc and we just started to talk and someone <coughs> bent down and tried to pull out the grass and this enormous mat of grass just kept coming away. It was about four or five metres wide. It was very easy just to uplift because the soil is so thin in those cracks on top of the plateau, nothing really, you know, really holds. 
And before we knew it, we'd sort of cleared a, a, a two meter squared area or something like that. And so we've, we've got this idea now of working together to go back and try and clear all of the grass off this plateau. We'll probably have to take away some of the soil that has accumulated under the grass because of uh, possible sort of weed, weedy species in there. And we're just going to basically watch and see what happens. If we open up that space on limestone, will some native species be able to disperse there? Can we actually translocate some species or plant them and see if they survive as well? So um, that's sort of what we're trying to do at a national level. QE2 Trust is trying to form these um, links with DOC and um, other organisations in limestone so that it's, it's a big issue, it's a big situation and it really needs collaboration and we'll wait and see you know, how some of that Kura limestone grass trial you know, goes and whether that can feed some good information back. Um, mapping, going to start doing some drone work. Um, as Clement pointed out, there's all sorts of health and safety limitations working on limestone and also, you know, you've got to think about walking over and over these rare mm -hmm. native plant species as well. So there's a thinking if we can send a quad quadcopter or a drone five, ten metres off the surface, take aerial imagery, knit it all together to make one nice big photo, can we actually conduct plant surveys off that mm -hmm. rather mm -hmm. than doing it by hand? Um, so we're going to be trialling that as well. Um, Geochemistry, uh, I think in New Zealand, in our restoration world, we're very good at addressing biological components to our, to our systems, but we don't think much about chemistry, and we don't think much about the sort of physical nature that's generating what all the biological components are sitting on. And I find that quite interesting, because in the horticultural or agricultural world, obviously soil chemistry and physical processes of erosion and wetting drying are a very big part. So um, we can sort of learn, I think we can learn a lot from the sort of the production landscape. And that, this is what our landowners, this is what our farmers can really bring to the table, is that they've got their on-site knowledge about these special protected areas, but they've also got that whole dimension about how their farm is working at that sort of physical chemical level as well. And, and, and we think that there could be some helpful hints in limestone that might help us understand this competition between native and exotic plant species as well. And I should just point out the top point, for about the last 20 years, Alice Shanks, a QE2 rep, has been going to some same, the same sites on limestone and plant, counting native plant species. So there's about a 20 year database of just repeatedly going back, doing the same thing over and over again, counting species. And that's the type of information that can start to feed into some of the management decisions that Clement is looking um, to have to make. But yeah, species and pictures, no problem. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So thank you, that's all I really wanted to say. I do have a couple of things um, here, if anyone wants to grab pamphlets about QE2. But any, any questions before?